Coming up on Main Street, we'll meet three men whose vision not only defines their work, but also impacts those around them. Funding for Main Street was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you who support quality programs such as Main Street that appear only on public television. Hello and welcome to Main Street, I'm Barbara Deeb. On this edition of the program, we're gonna meet three very different men whose vision is an important component of the work they do. WKU photographer Clinton Lewis has his eye on the world through the lens of his digital camera. His work in photography is influenced by his vision as a storyteller. An upcoming trip to Peru provides both risks and challenges for this talented photographer. P.J. Starks is an Owensboro independent filmmaker that has taken his vision for the art of filmmaking to the next step. He's begun to bring together both local filmmakers and audiences to share the intimate experience that comes with making movies. Dave Garrett is the Recreational Outreach Minister at First Baptist Church in Bowling Green. He has a vision for everyone he interacts with to be the best they can be at whatever they do. I got into photography back in my skater pump days when I was a skateboarder, um, teenage in high school, and um, you know, we'd, you know, we, when we'd go out and skate on the town around Bowling Green, we would uh, always have a camera with us, and you know, it just kind of stuck with me ever since then. And you know, I guess the rest is history. Every photo student's goal is to be a conflict photographer and shoot for National Geographic. So I mean, that was. That was what it was going to be, but uh, you know, life intervened, and um, my professional career took an entirely different trajectory than what I expected. But I think it's a much better one. You know, I had my family early, and so I elected to stay in in town in Bowling Green, and uh, you know, worked for the Daily News for about eight and a half years. Well, the fun thing about newspapers is that you never know what you're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you might know of, you know, an assignment or, you know, a football game or something a few days in advance. But what's really the most fun is the spot news, you know, the unplanned events. Um, and those are both fun and tragic because most of the time it's bad news that happens in that instant. And so, um, you know, as a news gathering you know, service, we would cover, you know, house fires, you know, hotel fires, um, accidents on I-65, and those are some images that I still can't get out of my head to this day. Just the destruction, the death, and um, it's just horrible. And so those are things that, um, you know, you have to cover. Um, you feel like a vulture doing it, but, you know, and those memories and those you know, images stick in your mind forever. You know, the job came open and it just seemed like a perfect fit. Um, I'd kind of, you know, shunned it off in my earlier, you know, youthful days as a photojournalist. I'm gonna be a documentary photographer for National Geographic. Everything else is, you know, out of the question. But um, with more experience and, you know, and the family life, it was like, you know, I could really, this could really be a good position for me. Um, because you know, I could almost go in and make the job whatever I you know, wanted to. And truly it's become, you know, you get out of it what you put into it. And I worked incredibly hard, you know, the first few years to really reestablish um, the office um, throughout the university um, and just really produce good, solid work. And people recognize good work. And, uh, and so that has opened up many doors for me here at the university. I had gotten to know um, one of our geography professors, um, Dr. John All, and you know, just in the course of talking one day, he's like, you know, I've kind of started this this whole idea, this project um, of 
climbing and science in Peru. He's like, would you, you know, want to come take pictures? And I was like, well, of course, I'm always ready to travel and go. Um, so it took us several months to get all the, uh, you know, all the details hammered out and get everybody on board. But eventually, um, you know, I got the okay to go document Dr. All's research with the American Climber Science Project um, under the umbrella of the American Alpine Club to the Cordillera Blanca Range in Peru. During the course of the two and a half weeks that I was there, not only did I document Dr. All's research, but you know, because I was also you know, on climbing groups with, with other members of the expedition, I ended up documenting the entire expedition as well, um, which was a huge benefit to the American Alpine Club and to the American Climber Science Program because it's a really unique program to bring you know, mountain climbers and scientists together for you know, a common purpose. Just honestly, the exhaustion was more of an issue than anything. Um, specifically on our second big trip out, um, as we hiked up the Santa Cruz Valley, uh, that was a 25 kilometer hike in, and we broke that up over two days, thankfully. But then as soon as we got to base camp, set up base camp the next morning, our guide wanted us to climb up to the shoulder between two peaks, um, Kitorahu and Alpamayo, and that's about a 3,000 foot climb, about 1,500 meters, right after the 25 kilometer hike in, right after two days that I spent with um, two other members of our expedition to where it was really just a training climb for me on a smaller peak to where I got up to 17,500 feet. All of this together with, with really not even a rest day. So by the time we started up to Kitorahu, I was just so physically spent and tired that I passed out and collapsed for a little bit before we even reached the snow field that we call the high moraine on this peak. And you know, and it's kind of blacked out for a while. I was just so physically exhausted um, that I couldn't move. And, and finally, by the time I got above the moraine, almost to the glacier field, I was just done. I was probably off route because I'd you know, lost the trail because everybody else was at least you know, 30 minutes to an hour ahead of me. And ended up just dropping my trekking poles, dropped the camera, dropped the pack and just laid down on the side of a rock for about 30 minutes before um, another hiker from Colombia found me and uh, you know, was able to kind of get me to sit up and you know, regain you know, somewhat of a focus and was able to go tell the group that he was gonna take me back down to base camp, that I was not going any higher, just with a combination of you know, exhaustion, altitude, you know, I was done. That was as far as I was going at that point goals for myself is to actually make a summit of a mountain and not get stopped 200 feet short. Um, and I just want to be a more capable climber. Now I'm on a pretty rigid um, fitness plan where I weight lift three days a week, do pretty tough cardio um, regimen. The, the other two days, um, really just to build up lung capacity, build up cardio, heart strength, and um, and build my body up to be able to withstand, you know, living in the mountains for three weeks. Um, you know, there's a, an old mountaineer's quote that says, the more blood, sweat, tears you put in the training, the less pain you'll have later in the mountains. You know, in 2011, I lost 12 or 15 pounds and came back pretty much a skeleton. So trying to be more prepared to be able to, you know, not be, as slow as I was in 2011, be able to keep pace and um, just be a more solid mountain climber. You know, just really get into the meat of what the scientists are doing when I hopefully return this summer, um, because it's science that will benefit everybody, not only the Peruvians. I would like, you know, the readers of my work to feel like they're there, that there's some authenticity, that it's not, you know, so many photos now are Photoshop conglomerates. I like authenticity. There has to be that sense of truth and purpose in a picture. That is, you know, what keeps me coming back is are those experiences of 
seeing something for the first time and just really being able to behold nature's beauty. And it's, it's a religious experience um, when you see um, this, these beautiful mountain vistas and you know sunrise just hits the top of the peak and um, amazing sunsets. And I just want the reader to feel like they're there, and that, that they are participating and that they have just a greater appreciation for what I'm able to bring back to them. I guess my passion for filmmaking just kind of, you know, I've, I've had that ever since, you know, I've, uh, since I was, you know, a teenager, and uh, I just, you know, really, I don't, I don't entirely know where it comes from. I guess it's, it's, it's almost like a, a primal part of me. It's, it's, you know, there, there. I'll be honest. There's been a, a few times where I've, I've thought, you know, on a, I've been working on a project, and I've told myself, I'm like, this is it. I'm never gonna do this again. But the funny thing is, is you can ask my wife. Anytime I say that out loud, she goes, no, by next week you'll have a whole other project going. And that's kind of how it has been. There's so much talent in this area. There's, there's so much talent in the region. And I guess when I started doing this, I wanted to, uh, you know, originally I wanted to run off to LA. Now, like I said, I wanted to be that next big thing, but it got to a point where I realized everybody wants to run off to LA, who, who, everybody who has this drive and this, this desire to, to tell stories and to do visual, visually artistic endeavors and whatnot, you know, they all say, I want to run out to LA. So the problem is, is when you go out there, you become, you know, small fish in, in big pond. You don't have to go to LA to make a movie. You don't have to go to LA to make something that has merit, something that you can be proud of. PJ took a step into his favorite genre when making Hallow's Eve, Slaughter on Second Street. And I'm a huge horror fan. Like that's kind of where my, my love lies. We ended up making Hallow's Eve the summer of 2008 over two months. It was the dead of summer. There was no air conditioning in this warehouse that we were shooting in. Um, but it was a really cool location. Hey there y'all, Buck Masters, a proud owner and operator of Slaughter on Second Street. I'll be honest, I had one panic attack while we were making it. Because I was thinking, oh man, you know, we, like one day I, we got behind. And I started freaking out because I'm like flip, I'm, you know, somebody said, how much more do we have left to do? So I start flipping through the script and I'm like, oh man. I mean, there, there's no way we're, we're getting out of here anytime soon. We're already two hours over. So I went outside and I was, you know, I just kind of, it was raining, it was like misting, and I just stared up at the sky and I was thinking, man, this is it. This, this movie's already over with before it's begun, and it's my fault. So um, everybody else kind of came outside, and they start talking about how awesome it is that they're getting to work on a movie. How that you know, it's not every day that you get an opportunity or a chance to work on a film in Owensboro, and they're talking about how excited they are, and, and they're acting really excited, and nobody's upset. And that's when I kind of realized that you know I wasn't the only one that was truly passionate about this film. Everybody was. Everybody had something at stake in this film. They, they, you know, they wanted it to be good. Needing a challenge, PJ wrote and directed A Mind Beside Itself. What I decided was is I'm not just gore, I'm not just splatter. You know, I've got, I, I have the, the ability to do something with substance. So that's when I decided that I was gonna do not only a whole different genre, but I was gonna up the ante and I was gonna challenge myself. <clears throat> and I was going to make uh, a thinker and there was a film idea a concept that I'd been sitting on for like five years you of course I bet you say that to all the girls you dream about no with you I mean it the other thing I went into the project with um, was when I did Hallow's Eve I, I did it you know cinematographer director writer I helped with lighting I helped with the boom mic um, so we donned a lot of hats. The one thing I didn't want to do when I went into my next project was I didn't, I didn't want to do a hundred different jobs. I wanted to be director. 
So anyway, so I made a mime aside itself in one weekend. Uh, so it was over th the course of three days, and it was in July of 2010. As a way to share what he loved with others, PJ found himself creating Owensboro's first film festival. An outgrowth of that was a six-week series of screenings for regional films. Unscripted was held in the Davis County Public Library and offered audiences a live interactive audio commentary with the filmmakers. You know, I'm huge on uh, special features. I love audio commentaries. So I was like, rather than sitting at home in your living room and listening to an audio commentary, what if you could be sitting right there next to the filmmaker and they're talking about their film as it's happening, live right in front of you. And if you don't like what they're saying, you can just interrupt them and ask them to change topic. It, it's almost like it takes the filmmaker back to being on set. And now they're pointing things out. Notice this in the background and, and you know, this, this is how we were able to pull this particular part of the film off. And it's actually become the most popular part of the film series is this live audio commentary. You, we, you know, maybe, maybe there is something to this, not just making films. You know, because being a filmmaker, I understand the struggles and, and the hardships when it comes to trying to get your work out there because it is difficult, especially when you're in middle America and there's really not a whole lot of venues to screen your work. And I guess it kind of it kind of comes down to, you know, somebody's got to, to open those venues. And I just happen to be one of those guys, I guess. So that's kind of how I got into doing this. So my, I guess my passion for films and making films has also turned into helping other filmmakers get their projects appreciated and enjoyed by the public. You know, I've gone from being the filmmaker to the events guy, to now the producer. And ultimately, I guess my goal is just to continue working with other filmmakers, networking, growing um, the area, creating more awareness uh, for what we're doing and what other filmmakers are doing, what I'm doing, and uh, you know, continue to, you know, who knows? Owensboro could be the next Sundance. I have this I have this thing I've talked about in life be the best and I've you know I've, I've come to realize that I, I'm, I've coached 27 years so 27 years I've coached track and field so through all that I've just I've just kind of developed this idea that I'm just gonna be my best now in track it's amazing sixth place gets a point and a couple of times I've had kids win a championship a, a team championship because we had a couple kids that were willing to get sixth in fact, that's all they could get. And so they bring back that one point, and we've literally won the region by one point a couple of times in my career in track. And so I got to thinking about that. I thought, how many times are you first? You know, if, if we were to start naming that out, all of, all of us thinking about that, it's very rare to, are we first? It's once in a while, and it's great, it's wonderful, and you've achieved an amazing thing. Well, we need to be the best second or third or fourth. What you know, we need to be willing to. If that's all we are for that, be that. Be the best you can be, and that's kind of what drives me. I like to kid about it and say I play kickball for a living. It's not true, but it's it's fun to say. And uh, we do a lot of cool things here at the Rock, the Recreation Outreach Center. We call it, and we call it the short for the Rock. And it's just been a blast for two 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 and a half years. I've been here on staff at First Baptist Church. We came on board and there were some things in place like Upward, uh, six churches in the community come together to make Upward basketball and football the two things we do right now. Children playing uh, that sport and learning about Christ all at the same time, how those things fit together. It's not over here and over here, they, they can actually be woven together and learn and play uh, and with, a, with a different spirit, with a different attitude and still play at the highest level. When I work with kids, whether it be here at church or in the community, I want to see this, this athlete 
Uh, this individual, if we're not working on an athletic thing, it, it, all the stuff, you know, some of the stuff I do is not athletics. Uh, I want to see them achieve their very best. I want them to grow up to be fine young men and women who, who have an understanding of who they are and who God is and who God wants that to be and how He can honor and bless that. So it's, it's, my, it's, it's so good for me when I see someone achieve something amazing. Maybe it's even better when they didn't think they could. And, and they were pushing back and, and resisting. And, and, and then we finally get to that place uh, where, uh, you know, they, they do that. Our church, First Baptist, has a Christmas program there. That's how I got introduced to it. I went down with our staff, our, our crew, we went down to do the Christmas program, so here we go. And I see these kids and I say, who's doing fitness with these kids? And of course they do PT with them, they call it PT, and they, they do it with them. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce a program to these guys and see if they would be interested in me taking the things I've learned from track and field, the plyometrics, the, the dynamic warm-up, all the things that go with track. Can, can I design a workout where, where I would do it with them? And I would be doing it with them, sweating right there with them, and then at, at, at the end of that, could I drop just a little scripture on them? Could I drop just a little hope, if you will, on them? Uh, there, there's always someone who's committed murder in the room, always. There's always kids who just stole a car or, or had a problem at school. There's, there's a variety of folks that are there. And so you've just got all those folks all mixed up together in front of you. I don't really get to know the kids. I don't know their cases. I don't know their situations. I'm here to give you some hope. I'm here to help you work out. I'm here to make, give you a chance to be better when you leave this room than when you came. And a person who invests in themselves emotionally and physically and, and we know all about the science that happens with exercise and laughter and other things. And so I don't, I don't pretend I understand all that, but I just know when we work out, we feel better and we do better. So it's my goal, my effort to make an impact. I want them someday to get out of there, look back and say, I don't even know, was it Mr. Garrett who came to help us? That guy made an impact in my life. And I pray for their cases. I pray for the people going in and out of their lives. I pray that they would find God along their journey here. And, and that, that they would not have to go alone. And I pray that God would send good folk into their lives to, to help them, I call it, get on the good road. And I said, you, you didn't just get here by accident. You know, we need to own it, deal with it, and get back in a better place. And you know, some of them are gonna have a way out. Some of them, are they have a long time to go here because of their, their offense. But it's my goal to give them hope and to let them know that God's in and around all that, some way, somehow, and at whatever place they are, they could maybe experience and find God. And they'll look back and say, well, I don't quite know how that came together, but it just did. It's a great thing when you can help someone get to a better place. I recently had an encounter where one of my athletes' families from Danville back in the day when I was at Boyle calls me. And this athlete of mine is, is, is in Texas, and she was in a treatment program that her family had taken her to. She'd aged out. She turned 18 and walked away from that program because she could, and she walked away. And it was interesting how we got back together all these years later after she's finished with track, she's done. I'm, you know, they call me and, and they ask me to get on board. So I'm calling Texas and I'm calling the church in Texas and I'm calling the program in Texas and I'm calling this girl and we're working, working, working. And, and, and I mean, we, we didn't know what would happen with her. But she needed to return to this program to get a little better. She'd done eight months, I'm finished, I'm good. She wasn't finished, she wasn't done. And so when she went back to that program, it was amazing to, to see you know, something good happen in her life that she needed that had nothing to do with track. They had nothing, it was over, all that's done for her now. But see a young woman who needed to get back on track, to get back on uh, the better life opportunity for her, and she went back to that program, amazing moment. And when they talked to me, I thought, man, how cool is it that I had the opportunity to not just teach her how to run the 800, not just help her win a couple of state championships, which she did, but now I'm helping her get a grip on her life. And, and to me, that's, that's probably as, as, as high a thing as anybody could ever, could ever say. And, and, and when, he, when, the, when his, the father hung up the phone, he, he said, Dave, thanks for being our friend. And, and that's, that's probably as big a compliment as someone could give you to call your friend. And I know we think we have a lot of friends, we have this, you know, Facebook thing and all that, but when someone calls me their friend, that's probably as big a thing as you could say to me, so. I count it a privilege to, to, for anybody to involve me in their life. I mean, I mean, seriously, for someone to give you the opportunity to be around them 
and learn from them and grow from them and encourage them if that's your role and your part, uh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, so every day I get up before my feet hit the floor, I'm saying, God, you just do with me whatever you want me to do and you bring the people into my life that I need to, to have with me. And I don't know, I just feel like there's a quest that I have that I, you know, every day I need to get up and go out there and make a difference. Uh, and, and, you know, be real about it, be honest about it, do my own thing, do my own prayer, do my own uh, preparation, but then give that away every chance I get. Uh, everybody needs a little encouragement in this whole world and there's just not enough of that around. And, uh, it's interesting, at the, at the end of the, every fitness group I do, uh, or, uh, we, we pray and I always, if I lead that prayer, I say, you know, God, I ask you to take what we've done here today and use it as an honor and a glory and a blessing to you. It's kind of like saying your grace right before you eat, except it's after. And, and we're saying, you know, God, we're giving you all this sweat and all this glory. I just think that, that I need every single day to say, what, what do you want me to be? And I'm ready to get after that just as hard as I can. One, two, three. Be the best. Well, we've come to the end of our journey. We hope you've enjoyed meeting these men of vision. Clinton Lewis, whose vision and endurance is a hallmark of his work. Filmmaker P.J. Starks, who's shared his vision of local filmmaking in Owensboro. And Minister Dave Garrett, whose vision is for everyone to strive to be the best they can be, no matter the circumstances. We'd love to hear from you. We welcome any questions, comments, or story ideas. You can check out our webpage at the address on your screen. Until next time, I'm Barbara Deeb. And remember, we're just around the corner on Main Street.